Here we're using Data Harvest Lightgate and Data Logger to measure the time period of a pendulum. So that's the light gate there. This is the data logger itself, is the vlog system, and then that goes into the laptop which records the data onto the vlog software. The usual way to get accuracy when you're measuring the time period of a pendulum is to just measure 10 full swings and then divide by 10. Here's the data for this experiment when I conducted it with a manual timing, so doing 10 full swings and divided by 10, and I ended up with 9.02 meters per second squared being G. That's the gradient of this graph, as I'll explain a bit later. And that's not very close, that's about 10% different from the true value. Using the data harvest light gate and the logger, I should get quite a lot closer than that. This is just using an ordinary school light gate, a data harvest one, and this vlog system, which thank you very much to data harvest for loaning to me. I'm still using the old software here, but essentially what you need to do when you set it up is measure the time. You want a pendulum setting, so it's measuring the time period, and then you can just click finish. And then as you press start, the data logger will record the time in between every other time the beam is broken, because that's the time period of pendulum. It's the time taken for one full swing. So this allows us to collect very accurate data for individual swings and you can ask students questions like well what's happening to the time period as the amplitude goes down and most of the time they're going to say oh look it does actually decrease ever so slightly each time but in fact that's because the thing is moving slower rather than an actual change in the time period. Understanding how the techniques that we use to take measurements affect their accuracy is a crucial understanding for A-level physics. It's only because we're reading to like six significant figures here that we see that very small change every swing. It's because the beam is being broken for a slightly longer time, so there's a slightly shorter time in between those breaks. So after establishing that the time period of pendulum does not depend on the mass or indeed the amplitude, then we can vary the length. That's gonna be the typical practical that we do with pendulums. We vary the length and we see how that affects the time period. So the, the length is the length of the string between the pivot point and the center of mass, and the time period is being measured on the computer by the EasySense software. The equation for a pendulum is time period is two pi root L over G. So the only factor that's gonna change in this case is the length. The only factor on earth, if you like, that affects the time period of a pendulum is the length. Sorry for the shaky writing on the screen there, that's me just flexing with the AR doodle function on my phone. Length we measure with a ruler. Think I could do this more accurately than I'm doing on the video whilst I'm holding my phone in my hand. We measure from the center of mass to the pivot point, to the point of suspension at the top of the pendulum. So I get 41 centimeters. How could you do that more accurately? Maybe clamping the ruler in place. It's not really appropriate to use a set square or a plumb bob because the pendulum is itself hanging vertically. But I hope you saw that I was getting down to eye level at 90 degrees to the scale so that I was avoiding parallax error. Your measurement of length is likely to be the larger uncertainty in this experiment because, well, I've only got two significant figures there and because there's no human error due to my reaction time in timing. This timing is going to be very accurate, especially if I'm just taking three significant figures from it. So for this length, I get 1.29 seconds as the time period. So the time period is 2 pi root L over G, and length is the variable that we're going to change in this experiment. I've just done it for one length, so let's see what, by rearranging this for G, what do I get as my measured value with this pendulum for g, gravitational acceleration. So firstly, to rearrange, square both sides, so that gets rid of the root. And now rearrange for g, so that gives me four pi squared l, which is the length of the pendulum, over t squared. Now input my numbers, obviously converting length into meters before I use it. Now calculate, and I get 9.73 meters per second squared. So how close was I? Well, you know the true value, the book value for gravitational acceleration is 9.81 meters per second squared. So it's usual to work out the difference between our answer and the accepted value as a percentage, and that would come out as roughly 0.1%. That's well inside the percentage uncertainty of measuring that length with the ruler. 
So that's just calculating g arithmetically for one length, but it's always going to give you a much more accurate answer if you think about your result as the gradient of a graph. So I suggest you go ahead and think about 4 pi squared L being your y-axis, t squared being your x-axis, and then g is the gradient, if you like. The difference in y is the top of the fraction, the difference in x is the bottom of that fraction, so g is the gradient. I am absolutely certain by doing that and plotting a line of best fit that you will get even closer to a true value of g with a pendulum set up in your lab at school. The use of gradients as kind of weighted averages is a really important principle in A-level physics. You probably do have some light gates somewhere in school for you to use, but if you don't, then timing 10 swings and dividing by 10 is a good way to reduce percentage uncertainty. Or if not, you could maybe try using video analysis like Tracker to do that, or a ultrasonic position sensor can also give you the sine wave graphs and you can take readings from that of time periods. You don't particularly need to use a timing marker or a fiducial marker here because the light gate is essentially being placed at the equilibrium position. If you do use one for timing, then you should place it at the equilibrium position because that's where the object is moving fastest and that's where you have the smallest increment of time to be measuring as accurately as possible with your stopwatch. The light beam should certainly be broken by the thinnest possible thing, so either the string or I'm using the stem of the mass hanger. But it would be quite interesting to use the body of the masses and think about them as being a length and you could actually then record some speeds for your oscillator at this, um, this equilibrium position and see how that compared with amplitude. That would be an interesting further experiment that you could do with this setup.